Hello, it's John Bresner from NUI Galway. So in this video we're going to look at media storage analog to digital. So this is another element of our mobile phones and many electronic devices we use today in that we have to basically work with um, some kind of information that's stored on our phone, maybe transmitted to our phone or being sent from our phone. And uh, oftentimes actually we have various files, operating system um, files, photographs, and uh, applications that are stored digitally on our mobile phones and we need to understand a little bit about how this works. Um, we can think of many applications I suppose that have moved from analog to digital. For example here's a picture of not only an old record player but something that also includes an analog um, radio receiver and also two analog tape decks for playing old cassette tapes. So how we used to listen to music and how we now listen to music, for example, this is a picture of the popular uh, Sonos One or Sonos uh, Play One being the new generation um, speaker uh, that you can actually talk to if you want to. Uh, we now listen to our music digitally. So the information that is representing the audio signal is stored, transmitted uh, and converted from some digital form that we can then listen to in our with our analog ears. So as I said, many things have moved from analog to digital. For example, video, which used to be stored on these uh, uh, cassette tapes or even more primitive forms. Um, now moving to stuff like little set-top boxes or media players. Uh, music then moving in another direction from these old analog synthesizers shown on the, on the left-hand side. And uh, moving to something you can basically just get a little keyboard add-on for your, your computer and do all of your tuning and uh, instrument creation on the fly through some kind of app. So how do we go from analog to digital signals? And first of all, what is an analog or, or, or a digital signal? So I'll come back to that again later on, but analog is essentially a continuous signal or a continuous waveform that has varying values. Um, it's uh, got multiple amplitudes that can um, basically represent some kind of signal of interest. So think of um, maybe some experiment you might have carried out before. Let's say you're, you're measuring temperature over the course of a day. You might decide that you want to take values of temperature at regular intervals. Um, and this is very similar to how we actually go about converting from a analog signal to what's called a digital signal. We take samples or values um, at certain points in time and we convert those to uh, a digital representation. Now if you're you know, running an experiment to measure temperature over time, you might just basically you know, read off values and write them down in, in, in a notebook. In uh, digital sampling, what we do is we basically create a representation of multiple values of a signal, and then we convert those into a sequence of ones and zeros. And depending on how accurate we want to have it, we may have um, two different aspects. One is how many levels of signals do we have? So you can see here on this picture, particular picture that there are uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven levels of signals plus zero that we can basically um, quantify. And then on the other hand is how often do we want to take um, a value of the signal? So in the time domain, how often are we going to take a sample of that gray analog signal? Um, and then what we do is we, we, we create a representation. You can see here that there are basically um, values being taken at different points here along the signal, and then we can store those in, in, a, in a digital form. So there's two ways we can do this. We can either approximate a analog signal using a a series of um, fixed lines representing different digital values and um, there might be a varying sampling frequency shown uh, on the time axis here that means that basically we don't have a fixed time at which we take a value it can it can change over time depending on the nature of the signal or we might have some other version which isn't the one shown here but for example imagine you had basically a sample taken every uh, half a second for example where you're taking if this was temperatures you would be taking basically a a sample of the signal at regular intervals along the time domain. And then what we do is we represent each of those samples using a sequence of ones and zeros. And those ones and zeros would represent typically the level at which the value occurs at a point in time. So for example, at this point in time, we are at level, for example, one, two, three, four, we might have a certain sequence of, um, of ones and zeros representing this value of four, which we would store and then at another later time, we have the value of four again, value of three, and so on. So we'd store a series of ones and zeros representing the different values taken over time. As I said, either at 
fixed intervals or at varying intervals depending on the, the sampling frequency, if it's a fixed frequency or, or a varying frequency. And again, just to recap, by frequency we mean how often we're doing something. If we are taking a value every half a second, as I mentioned, that basically is a frequency of what we call 2 hertz. So we have a, an easy conversion from frequency to time by saying, well, how often are we doing it? Then that means uh, there's, a, there's a corresponding value in terms of time and frequency. So for example, if we say every uh, 0.5 seconds, um, that means we're taking, for example, in one second, we're going to take two samples that corresponds to a frequency of two hertz because um, basically F is equal to one over T. So t is our time, which is 0.5 seconds, and f then is 1 over 0.5, which is equal to 2. Uh, if we were taking, um, for example, a frequency of 10 hertz, then that would be every 0.1 seconds, and so on. So you can imagine then, as we start to go up to very high frequencies in, in uh, you know, the megahertz and uh, gigahertz and kilohertz range, they are taking, you know, potentially thousands or millions of samples per second. So some of the advantages of digital over analog, well, I mentioned there that basically we have a, a digital signal that is, is, a, is, is, a, um, is a sequence of ones and zeros. So you can imagine it being something that is, you know, basically either one or a zero at, at a point in time. And it says at the top there that it's less susceptible to noise. Well, why should this signal be less susceptible to noise than any, any other kind of signal? So why is this less susceptible to noise than, you know, an analog signal that looks like this? The reason is, if you add noise on top of this signal, you can imagine some kind of noise on top and bottom of, of this digital signal. Now, I haven't shown it very straight there, but this is just a sequence of ones and zeros. And the ones and zeros are basically represented by a high voltage and a low voltage. Um, whereas in this signal here, as we start to introduce noise, it really does distort the actual value of the signal. And by, and by really distort, I mean that for digital signals, we basically have a threshold over which or below which we can count something as being uh, a one or a zero. So we have a threshold, an upper and lower threshold of values for something being a one. And even if there's noise added on top, it doesn't really matter. And then we have an upper and lower threshold for something being a zero. So again, even if there's noise added up and, uh, uh, or, or sorry, on top of or at the bottom of this zero and one signal, we can still detect something as being a, a one or a zero. So once it's in a certain range, we know it's a one and once it's in a certain range, it's zero. And usually a bit of noise on top of that doesn't affect it. Whereas in this analog value here, imagine these are temperatures or voice signals or whatever. As we add noise on top of that, we can't actually easily reconstruct what the original value was. Um, the other good thing about digital signals is that they can be reproduced without loss of information. So for example, if you're sending a set of ones and zeros and you uh, can reliably transfer, transfer them or store them or transmit them from one place to another, you can reproduce the original without a loss of information. We can also include what's called error checking, where we can, for a particular sequence of ones and zeros, we can add in some kind of extra couple of bits or ones and zeros to act as what we call a check for the bits that have gone before. So you can perform essentially a mathematical operation um, to check if a set of uh, ones and zeros have been transmitted or stored correctly. And then the last point here is that digital can be compressed to achieve more efficient storage. So you'll be familiar with formats like MP3 or MP4 or M4V. Basically these are compression formats and one of the most common ways in which compression works is it takes a repeating series of ones and zeros and reduces them to a simpler representation that represents that repeating sequence. And you look for patterns and try and um, um, basically introduce a series of ones and zeros that represents uh, longer repeating patterns through a smaller uh, compressed version. Some of the disadvantages of digital as post analog is that, as you may be imagining, we haven't said how exactly it works, but digital circuits are more complex because you have to do some conversion from analog to digital. They may use more energy. And there is a potential for errors if the signal changes more rapidly than it's being sampled. So I talked earlier on about the um, example of, of a temperature, okay? And just again, imagine some kind of temperature that's varying over time. But for some reason, we decide to only sample every, I don't know, five seconds or every, you know, one hour. If you're sampling at time periods where, you know, you're, you're basically losing out on, um, on information that's happening in the middle, you can have errors. So this is a very simple example where we've got some temperatures changing over time. And um, 
because we're taking at these fixed intervals I've marked here by dots, we're basically missing all these variations here in the middle. This would be fine if the temperature looked uh, something like this, where there's kind of very gradual changes over time. But if you have rapid changes in between various sampling intervals, then that can be an issue. And it's not just for you know temperatures, it could be for any type of, um, of, of signal, for example, audio signals, music, and so on. Now, I mentioned ones and zeros and, uh, you know, bits uh, briefly, but we're going to go into a bit more detail on these. But again, just thinking back to your mobile phone and the type of storage you might have on a, on a typical phone, it may be built in, it might be some external um, SD card. And just to give you a kind of indication of, uh, of, of these different types of terms, let's say we have a, an SD card that holds 32 gigabytes. Well, then in terms of actual content, that could potentially hold about... 8,000 mp3 files which are four minutes long. So think of uh, a song that's four minutes long. Imagine a 32 gigabyte card being able to hold um, 8,000 of those which corresponds to over 500 hours of audio. So what do all these terms like GB and MB and mp3 and SD and so on mean? Well let's have a look at a couple of those now. mp3 is a, as I mentioned, a compression format um, which can be used to compress audio. Um, SD is a particular type of um, solid state storage device for um, for many types of mobile and camera applications. But let's look a little bit more at uh, gigabytes, megabytes and bits and so on. So first of all, a digital system is a data technology that uses discrete or discontinuous values. And by discrete, I mean a sequence of ones and zeros. Contrasted with an analog system where we have a continuous set of values, we're basically taking values at fixed points in time. So we have to have a understanding of how quickly we want to imagine changes happening, but no matter how fast those changes, we only take samples or values at discrete point in times, irrespective of the frequency. We can't have a continuous set of values. Um, digital data is composed in, as I said, as, as a sequence of ones and zeros, and this is what we call the binary system. So we have different types of number systems, the decimal system or base 10, hexadecimal system or base 16 and this is the binary system which we write as as base 2. So for example if we have a um, a number written in uh, in digital it's basically a sequence of ones and zeros whatever it, um, that corresponds to in, in decimal and then we write a subscript 2 to refer to the fact that it's in the binary system. We use the the base 10 system all the time if a number is 56 for example in the base 10 or 83 uh, in the base 10 we usually omit the base 10 because we're used to dealing with digital. Um, but it is useful if you're writing a combination of, of, of uh, decimal and um, binary numbers to in include the base 10 or the base 2. Um, so what's binary data and what's a bit? So bit is essentially the short for binary digits. You can see the B-I-T-S there in the name. And then you'll also probably have heard terms like byte. And a byte is essentially... 8 bits okay so a bit is a 1 or a 0 so imagine you've got um, um, some data a bit is essentially going to be a single 1 or a 0 or a single 0 and a 1 and then a, uh, a bit is um, one element of a byte which consists of a sequence of 8 ones or zeros so a byte for example again could be you know 8 ones or zeros I've just written some random numbers here from my head um, all in sequence so this is a byte 8 ones or zeros we sometimes have then groups of bits called words. You can have different size words depending on the application. And then as I said, digital information is passed as a stream of bits. For example, here's a, streams of, a stream of, of ones and zeros. Could be re uh, representing temperatures. It could be representing some um, EHG or ECG uh, records. Um, it could be representing music, audio, uh, traffic data. This is how all um, digital and computerized information is, is typically represented as a stream of ones or zeros. So again, you've heard of the terms gigabytes and megabytes. Well, if a bit is uh, a one or a zero, and a byte is um, eight ones or zeros, then giga is going to be um, a multiple of that. So giga represents 10 to the power of nine. Okay, so we're used to, again, different terms like um, kilo representing 10 to the power of three, um, mega representing 10 to the power of six, giga then being 10 to the power of nine, tera, and so on. So giga is 10 to the power of 9, and if we're talking about a gigabyte, then we have roughly 10 to the power of 9 multiplied by a byte, 
which is 8 bits. Okay, so a gigabyte should be then approximately 8 billion bits. In reality, it's a little bit more complicated because one gigabyte is actually corresponds to, because this is a binary, we have 2 to the power of 30. And 2 to the power of 30 is um, more than 1 um, or 10 to the power of 9 uh, um, bits. We have, um, sorry, bytes. We have 1 gigabyte is not um, 1 billion bytes, but it's actually this number here, which is 2 to the power of 30. And then that in turn, of course, is uh, multiplied by 8 to give you the number of bits. Okay, so 1 gigabyte um, roughly is 10 to the power of 9 by 8 bits, but in, in actuality, it's 8 and this lot number here in terms of bits. Okay, so a bit more. No joke, no pun intended. Um, so the next size, imagine how many ones or zeros would it take to store 33.3 hours of audio? Given the values we had on the uh, on, on on the previous um, on the previous slide, so we had some values there for um, sorry three slides previous actually, we had some values here in terms of how much audio corresponds to how many um, megabytes. Have a go at this exercise yourself in terms of well how many ones and zeros then would it take to store thirty three point three hours of audio given the um, MP three compression numbers we talked about uh, three slides ago. So just assume that these are mp3 files and that typically um, a 4 megabyte file would correspond to 4 minutes. We'll just assume 1 megabyte per minute. So 33.3 hours would be how many ones or zeros? So digital signals are used for the transmission of digital data from one place to another. For example, we talked um, previously about the um, microphone in, in a mobile phone. The microphone takes audio from the outside world it converts it into a uh, electrical signal, um, and then that electric signal is converted in into a sequence of digital data. Um, and there's many applications where we, where we are taking digital data and moving it from one place to another. So this could be, you know, in our TV applications, health applications, computers, uh, mobile phones, in the home, whatever whatever it is, industry, manufacturing you have digital signals which consist of sequences of ones and zeros moved from one place to another, to another. And what we typically do is we represent those ones and zeros as voltages. And uh, you'll have different systems using uh, different um, levels of voltages. But for example, we typically have a zero for, uh, zero volts I should say, for zero and binary. And then the one, depending on the type of system, will be represented by different values. One type of system we use is, it uses five volts to represent a one. Another one may use 3.3 volts. Some others may even use 2.5 volts. But whatever it is, we have a positive voltage representing a value of one and a zero voltage typically representing a value of zero. So we send data as a sequences or a series of voltages corresponding to um, changing uh, um, binary data or, or bits. Again, they may be, for example, fixed length. So you've got a zero, a one, zero, maybe two ones in sequence, if these are all of the same length, I haven't drawn them exactly equal here, but again, you can imagine as a series of zeros, ones uh, being transmitted from one place to another. We're going to talk later on about digital logic, which are essentially the types of systems that we can then use to manipulate or transform or work with these um, digital signals. So again, imagine a digital signal coming from a traffic light and another digital signal coming from another traffic light. And we want to do some kind of operation based on those digital signals to perhaps activate a pedestrian crossing or uh, send some notification back to, uh, to our, our, uh, our traffic control system. We can use what are called logic or logic gates to do this. And we have a whole set of logic gates we're going to talk about in the next video, representing the different types of operations that can be carried out on digital data. And these are the seven most common ones uh, here. We have the one here in the top here. This is a, a NOT gate or an inverter. Essentially, quite simply, it takes a one or a zero and produces a zero or a one at the output. So if you've got a, a, a one here, you'll have a zero at the output. Conversely, if you've got a zero here, you'll get a one at the output. And all of these other types of, um, of gates then produce um, other types of logic. We've got what's called an AND gate or an AND gate here shown on the second row. We have an OR gate and an OR gate shown here in the third row. And we have uh, what's called an exclusive OR or an exclusive NOR gate shown here in the last row. And again, these will take 
two or more inputs um, and perform some kind of operation, logical operation on them to manipulate those inputs. So we're going to leave it there for now and I will see you in the next video. Thanks.